us here to Spirit Store, an absolutely beautiful setting. I'm really looking forward to an interesting <coughs> discussion. Um, the Institute of International European Affairs has been going around for 30 years, and we are a think tank. So we try to provide a forum for discussion of important issues. So why are we here this evening? Well, the European Union is in a, a very interesting phase of its development. And there is, of course, Brexit. Nobody in the border communities know, needs to be told about the importance of that. But there are so many other issues that the European Union is trying to tackle. So we've put together a panel today uh, to try to explore one or two of those issues. We're going to talk a little bit around globalization and how it is impacting on everybody's lives, how it's impacting on the future of work. Uh, people living in this part of the world will be familiar with the uh, the impact of globalization through eBay and the loss of jobs here a couple of years ago. Uh, so on the one hand, globalization brings jobs to this part of the world, and on the other hand, where labor costs can be found more cheaply, that has impact on everybody. And we'll also talk about issues around automation and the loss of jobs in banking and driving. And we might talk about the impact of trade and the uh, pressure from uh, President Trump and others who are not necessarily as interested in uh, the order that has established over the last few years. So it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, often with these kind of events, uh, the best part is the Q&A. So we are encouraged, uh, especially those of you who have uh, a glass of alcohol in front of you, <laughs> to be as challenging as possible. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming here this evening. Uh, I acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, Declan Brannock TD uh, uh, and, and also uh, councillors who are with us and candidates, I believe. <laughs> Uh, so I hope you'll all uh, take part and show lead, and then uh, we look forward to hearing all of your opinions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Gavin Riley. I'm political correspondent with TV3. I'm delighted to ask and try and facilitate hopefully should be a fairly interesting chat with you for the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, as you'll notice, Helen McEntee has changed her hair. Uh, and colour. Uh, and and colour. And everything else. Um, as you, for those of you who didn't catch up, um, Helen McEntee, uh, given the nature of globalisation and European relations as they are, uh, was asked to tag along with the Taoiseach when he had a meeting with the new Spanish Prime Minister earlier on, so she is in Madrid, so uh, Michael Darcy, Minister of State at the Department of Finance, has kindly agreed to step in in her place, so we're delighted that Michael was able to make it. Uh, as well, we have Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist with the IEA and also Economist with Independent Newspapers. And Marie Sherlock, who is Chief Economist with uh, SIP2, one of the country's largest trade unions. The empty chair at the end will, uh, in hopefully in not too long, be occupied by Matt Carthy, MEP for Sinn Féin for the uh, Midlands Northwest constituency. Uh, the only reason he's not here now is because he's on his way back from Strasbourg. He is on, a, on the road in a car on the M1. But again, he's just come from a supranational parliament, which is about as great as, as an emblem of globalisation and international cooperation as you could possibly think of. So he's literally just on his way back. He landed from Strasbourg about half an hour ago. He's in the car on the way up and we'll hear from him in good course. Um, it's an interesting day to be talking about globalisation because obviously those of you who are downstairs watching the football for the last two hours, it's the most uh, festival, greatest celebrated festival of the world's most global sport you could ever think of. And everyone's going to be looking at the interactions between nations uh, for the next couple of weeks or so. Um, but I remember reading something fairly recently by a uh, really well-respected economist uh, called Simon Cooper, who is also a really, really noted uh, football writer, which is an unusual overlap in that kind of Venn diagram. Um, and he says, he reckons the reason why international football became so big in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was because uh, it was basically the replacement for war. You know, we, we live in the, the time in Europe where we've had the longest successive uh, era of peace, where no European countries have been at armed conflict with each other, in the history of, of Europe and the history of, of mankind. And he reckons that basically sport has taken over from that. Sport is this kind of a civilised war, where you just pick out your 11 best people and they have a war for an hour and a half, 45 minutes each side. They swap ends at half time in the war, uh, repeat the war, and they go on and have more war, and the winner gets to have more war with someone else. But it's basically the way that you express countries. And yet it's actually interesting, and I don't know how many of you are football fans, I'm guessing the fact that you're actually here and not watching the World Cup means that not many of you are in fact soccer fans. Um, but it's interesting that in fact it seems like international football has maybe you know, died off a little bit in the last couple of years because we now actually live in a world where nations and countries and national identities don't matter quite as much because we don't live in the little silos that we used to where we didn't really know what was going on from one country to the next or it was very difficult to communicate. We all now know that with the way in which communication has sped up that in fact national boundaries mean almost less now than they have ever done. 
And that has some great good things because it means that we understand people from other parts of the world uh, an awful lot easier, but it also has its downsides because it means that if there's parts of the world in which you're looking for manufacturing and it's cheaper to go to a, a sweatshop in the, the southeast Pacific Rim, then obviously that has its downsides for certain parts of the world too. So we're going to talk a little bit about all of that. The, the title of the forum is Whose Job Is It Anyway? Uh, which obviously is a reference to well, who's going to actually be doing the jobs in this globalised world where there's fewer and fewer barriers, or maybe there aren't fewer and fewer barriers, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but also, if globalisation does come with certain risks, whose job is it to deal with risks? Is it you know, national governments, the likes of which the micro represents? Is it the EU as a whole? Who actually has to step in and try and safeguard the ordinary citizen, the ordinary worker, the ordinary person on the street, the ordinary man, woman, boy and girl in school? Who has to step in and defend those people as globalisation begins to tear down whatever there is still left of borders between the world? Uh, we're going to start with contributions from each of the speakers. And I'm going to start just by virtue of seniority because he's here and he could, uh, I'm within arm's distance if I don't like what he says. Uh, we'll start with uh, Michael Darcy, Fine Gael TD for Wexford and Minister of State at the Department of Finance. Michael, uh, what are your thoughts? Globalisation, how has it helped Ireland? What are its risks? Yeah, well, it certainly has helped Ireland a lot. And if you look at where we are today, where we were just a short number of years ago, going back to 2011 when we lost hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, at the bottom of the recession. And one of the things that we have done successfully is we have brought in a lot of international companies, uh, globalized names. So if you take uh, the sector that I'm involved in with a lot of banking and international finance companies, put it in context, we have nine of the top 10 international banks in the world with operations in Ireland. We have eight of the top insurance companies in the world. And then more importantly than, than actual individual sectors, the future that I see is technology. And we have about 18 of the 20 technology companies. Again, all the household names that you would know and understand, whether it's Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Intel, all of those are here. Um, we've done well out of it. There's about 225,000 jobs that are foreign direct investment jobs directly from those companies here in our jurisdiction in Ireland. Uh, the calculation is there's another job attached to each one of those. So that's about 450,000 jobs either directly responsible by FDI companies or indirectly employed from them. So to put that into context, we're getting close to 2.2 million people back to work. And those are hugely important jobs for the jurisdiction that is Ireland. And one of the things that I was looking at, you know, the, the poster on the wall and, and the piece on the table is where are the jobs, you know, and, and what the future is going to be. We really don't know. And I'm just amazed at the speed of technology, automation, robotics, machine learning uh, that's in the sector that I have, which is financial services. So you would have seen Citigroup Citigroup are, the, are one of the largest banks in the world. Um, they've been in Ireland since the 1950s. 3,000 employees in Northern Ireland. 2,600 employees in Ireland. And they said yesterday that they believe within three to five years they will lose 10,000 jobs because of automation, because of technology. And that's a huge challenge to try and ensure that those people don't find themselves um, in a space that, when I was a kid in Gori, uh, there was a the leather factory, and there was a the leather factory closed, 200 jobs went, but these were people who only knew one thing, how to manage leather, and that was the late 1970s, and most of those men, particularly, when I was, I was nine years of age at that stage, and I will I'll always remember, over the next decades, those men, none of them were re-employed. And that's the challenge of how you get people who have a skill set in one area <clears throat> to redirect themselves and become re-employed in a different area. And we see that uh, internationally um, in the US in coal, the <coughs> conversation about how we use coal and bring coal and technology, how, how we cross over to get those people back into a blood. It's a big challenge. And the challenge is, is huge when you consider we don't know what the next technology is going to bring or where the next technology is going to have an impact upon. You kind of touched upon driving, automation. You know, there are millions of people worldwide who are em employed in driving, in deliveries. And uh, those are the challenges that we face.
but for me, um, for me as somebody who saw the impact on people who lose their job in one <coughs> area without an ability to redirect themselves, well, that's the big challenge. Fascinating thoughts. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, Marie, I'm going to come to you and just to, as a jumping off point for your uh, couple of thoughts about um, what Michael has said. When he lists off the uh, number of people, the, the employers, the, you know, the major impact in which uh, globalisation and foreign investment has had in Ireland, mm -hmm. it's responsible for such a, a mammoth amount of jobs that it's very difficult not to look at a, a top level stat like that. It employs 450,000 people and say that globalisation has been really helpful for Ireland. Well, globalisation has been part of the Irish success story, particularly, uh, I suppose, since the 1950s in Ireland, and I suppose the number of firms that are coming. So, you know, I think, it, it, you know, it's a positive, and I think sometimes we um, all too often, or particularly on the left, globalisation has become a dirty word or a bad word. It doesn't need to be, I suppose, once it's tempered by the correct, uh, I suppose, fiscal and social policy framework. And I suppose that's one of the things that... Um, you know, when I was asked to speak today, I suppose one of the things that really jumped out at me was, you know, whose responsibility is it to try and address the negative impact of globalisation? And there are positive impacts and negative impacts of globalisation, uh, both here in Ireland and I suppose across the European Union. And just in terms of that response, social policy in the EU has always been the Cinderella of policy in the European Union. So even going back to the Treaty of Rome, there was a reference there, as there were in each successive uh, treaty, to promote the well-being of all the peoples of the EU. But I suppose there was a school of thought uh, then, and, and it remains now, that price stability and economic integration were going to be the primary tools for improving the welfare of people in the European Union. Um, and I suppose we have seen that that has failed. That alone cannot ensure, um, I suppose, a decent standard of living to, to everybody working in the European Union. So I see that there's two crises in, in, in the EU at the moment which are directly linked to, I suppose, the downsides of globalisation, and which is why that we need a very strong social response by, uh, uh, by the European Union. So the twin crises are the political crisis and the productivity crisis. And we're all aware of the political crisis, Brexit, and the increasing number of countries that are electing far-right populist parties, Eurosceptic parties. So we're seeing it in Austria, in Poland, in Hungary, with an Irmis, with the Netherlands, there's Sweden, Denmark, uh, Italy, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a number of countries. And indeed in Germany, uh, the, the accession to Parliament of the AfD in Germany, I think is a wake-up call to all of us that Euroscepticism on the far right is a very significant presence now, and, and hence the role of social policy uh, in the EU to actually combat some of the negative perceptions around the EU project is all the more important now. The second crisis with regards to productivity, and this isn't really spoken about very much, but I think is very important in terms of understanding the genesis for some of the policy changes that we have seen uh, promoted and promoted by the European Union over the past, um, I suppose, year or three years in particular. So going back 20 years ago, um, productivity increases in, 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 in the European Union were, were about 2.5%, one, between 2 and 2.5%. Two and we're now at less than 1%, half of the rate in the US, uh, and certainly um, a, a, a fraction of the productivity growth that we're seeing in, our main, in, in the main competitive threats uh, in the BRIC countries and in other emerging economies. And I think ultimately um, that is uh, prompting a huge concern within the European Union about how we are going to compete into the future. Because if we can't increase our productivity, then we can't, uh, I suppose, um, uh, there is a limit to the growth of the European <coughs> Union and ultimately the sustainability of the European Union project. So what has happened over the past number of years? Well, we've seen under Juncker's uh, commission the, um, the unveiling of their uh, social pillar, their pillar of, 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 of social uh, rights, um, which I suppose has been a very profound uh, and welcome change um, in terms of a focus on uh, fairness, combating inequality um, and that the EU is taking a leading role now in a way before the view was that social policy should be just delegated to the member states. Uh, but the EU does have a role in coordinating 
and in funding. And I suppose this is one of the big disappointing uh, points at the moment is that we're having this big discussion about the EU budget and yet about 80% of the EU budget is not being allocated to, I suppose, the things that I would consider are necessary um, uh, with regards to employment and, uh, and uh, digital skills agenda, etc., um, that, that is so greatly needed within the European Union. So uh, I, I, I think the, the uh, promotion of the, of the pillar of, of, of social rights is, is very important. We're not seeing the funding behind it. Indeed, a lot of it is taken in the form of recommendations as opposed to directives to member states. So in terms of that impetus to member states to act is not as great as what we would like. But it is a start, and it's the direction we need to go if we're to sustain the EU project, I suppose, over the long term. Okay, thanks very much for that, Marie. Fascinating thoughts. Um, Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist here at the IEA. Um, I suppose you could argue that globalisation works two ways. It has been a rising tide which has lifted a lot of boats, but there is a danger that once you reach a critical mass, that if the rising tide continues to rise, that it just drowns everyone that we thought was helping. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Take that um, a moment. Yeah, yeah. okay. But I, I, I suppose I, I, I like, to, like talking about this because there's some subjects that are pretty depressing, but I think globalization is overall uh, has a lot of good aspects to it. The downsides of it tend to be exaggerated, and there's a lot we can do about the downsides, a lot of policy responses we can have for the downside. And, you know, one of the things, just to come back at your, your World Cup sort of piece, is the difference between people, countries trading with each other in the World Cup is there doesn't have to be any losers. You know, countries trading with each other, both sides can win. It's not a win-lose situation. That's the, the sort of the win-win dimension of commerce and trade, I think, are a really important part of, of, that, uh, of that piece. So look, let me just look at those three things, the, the positives of globalization, the exaggerated downsides, and what we can do about it. Let, let's look at the downsides. When people talk about globalization, there tends to be, and I don't think it's just on the, on the left, I think it's across the political mm -hmm. spectrum, and I think it may be to do with human bias, is that we tend to, to look more at the plant closure that can devastate an area than we do to celebrate this week. The IDA came out, for example, with yet another you know, increase in the amount of jobs the companies it, it brings in create. That's not going to get the front page. But, you know, when Adele shuts down, that's going to get the front page because we tend to report the bad things more than we report the good things. So I think that, that's across the political spectrum. Um, so, you know, when people talk about globalization, we th think about, you know, left behind in, in the U.S. and rust belts and these sort of things. But, hey, there are more people working, more jobs in the United States today than there have ever been in history. People are always talking about jobs going and jobs going abroad and technology uh, killing off jobs. There are more people, nearly 160 million people working in the United States, than, uh, and that's more than ever in history. It's the same thing in Japan. It's the same thing in Australia. In the European Union, it is also the same thing. There have never been more jobs in Europe than today. Now, Ireland, we're almost back. We had, this, as we know, massive crisis. But let's also think about globalization. Between the foundation of this state and the 1960s, we were the opposite of globalization. We were closed off. What happened to jobs in this country? We actually shrank the number of people working in this country. For the first 50 years of this state's history, the number of people working in this country actually declined. If we go back 25 years when globalization started, we had around the same number of people working in the 1990s as we did in 1926. We had no jobs growth, net between the foundation of the state and the 1990s. Since between the 1990s and 2007, employment doubled. And that's when we really became globalized. So I would argue that rather than killing off jobs, globalization actually grows jobs. And that's not only the case in countries with lower wages, where some of those jobs like textiles and shipbuilding go, it's everywhere. Okay, Every developed country has more people at work today than 20 years ago. So that, I just sort of think, I think those sort of facts are important in, the, in, in, the, in looking at uh, the, the whole piece. Um, another big upside of globalization is, is poverty reduction. 200 years ago, a billion people lived on this planet, and almost everyone lived at subsistence levels. Now there are more than 7 billion people, and there's 500 million people living at subsistence levels, and it's falling rapidly. Okay, so not only is the share of the world population living in real poverty uh, falling, but in absolute numbers it's also falling. I'm not saying it's all down to globalization, but globalization is a big part of it. And 
there's no doubt that globalization can cause downsides. It can accelerate change. And again, just like the good things happen in the world don't happen because of glo all happen because of globalization, nor do the bad things. There would still be companies closing down if we didn't have globalization. Uh, that, that's just the nature of the economic development pro process. Uh, companies grow and, and they, they decline. Uh, so the, 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 the even better news is that governments have lots of policy instruments to deal with, uh, to deal with uh, job losses of that kind. We have education systems, training systems, mm -hmm. welfare systems. Um, and these are very, you know, different countries do better on this than other countries. And I would argue that one reason why America has this Rust Belt problem more than other countries <laughs> is because they don't do uh, the kind of retraining uh, and social safety net that we do in Europe, which gets people back into work more effectively than the United States. Um, now, the question that we're looking at today is what role for Europe? M my sense is that where, where should policy be done? Should it be done at the global level, at the Europe level, at the national level, at the local level? From most areas around education, training, welfare, I think it's more sensible at the, at the national level. I'm not convinced, and I'm open to it, the case to be made, but I'm not convinced there's a huge case that we say we take our training role and we have a kind of commissioner in Brussels that sets training for everywhere. It makes total sense that we say regulate chemicals. It's crazy that we'd have 28 parliaments regulating the thousands of chemicals we use. I think it's really sensible we do that at the European level, but I'm not convinced that it's a good idea that we do education and training and welfare at European level. I think it's a, it's a function better carried out at national level, with the possible sole exception of unemployment benefit. In the Eurozone, we've got a clear problem that when one part of the Eurozone goes into a deep recession like Greece has done, that it gets into this cycle of, of cuts and austerity and can't get out of it. It may be a good idea to have a centralized unemployment fund so that if a country like Greece has, goes into a real slump, money goes from the rest of the, of, of the, the other countries into the country with a real slump that might help it get out of that. Uh, so that's one area where I think there could be a case for a European level uh, welfare system. Okay, interesting thoughts. Thanks very much for that, Dan. Uh, this would be the moment where I would ask Matt Carthy to give a five minute speech to you about uh, whose responsibility it is to guard against the worst excesses of globalism. Obviously, he's not here, but we'll get to him in a couple of minutes. So I'm afraid just for the moment, where you're going to have to represent your wing of the spectrum alone. Um, what do you make of, of, first of all, Dan's first point that ultimately a lot of the time, we tend to look at globalization and we tend to think of it or at least talk about it in terms that are someone wins and someone loses, that it's a zero-sum game, when in actual fact, a lot of the time, as Dan has given some stats to suggest, that everybody wins. Well, not, not everybody wins. And I think just to pick up on the point about, the, I suppose, the inherent bias of media in terms of reporting on uh, factory closures or when there is job losses, and anybody who stood in a room where, you know, a number of people are going to lose their jobs, it's a very awful place to be. Um, because that has a profound impact on people's lives. So, you know, it, I think we would have often thought that probably not enough is made of when a company closes, and indeed the impact um, on those people uh, in the weeks and months after that. So, but I think one of the things that, that has really struck me here about the good news story with regards to employment, uh, in the US and here and, and across the EU over the last number of years is that yes, like in Ireland at the moment we're going through, going through you know, Dan touched on it there, the second fastest period of employment growth that the state has ever had, bar the, the uh, 96 to 2004 uh, period. Um, so we're going through a really fast period of employment growth and that is to be celebrated. But I think we also cannot just solely focus on the quantity of jobs but it's the quality of jobs. And uh, I, I noticed that the phrase uh, that has been used in terms of the exaggeration um, of, uh, of, of, you know, um, I suppose, you know, the issues within the labour market. Well, I, you know, I, I think we've always had an issue within the labour market, except we're getting more of an opportunity to try and articulate it now. There's one in five people in this country, just short of 20% of people in this country, that get up every day that face into some sort of insecure work. Now, not all of that work is low paid, but it's insecure. And certainly how 
uh, the labour market is regulated, how well the social welfare system is equipped to be able to address and support those people to ensure that they have a decent standard of living, I think is a real question. Is, is that globalisation though or is that just technology? Like a lot of those people who have insecure employment, I mean it's, it's in oh, hand no, in hand with the gig economy, it's not necessarily all just to do with globalisation or manufacturing jobs or moving elsewhere. It's neither globalisation or technology, in some ways it's, 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 it's new employment forms and in particular I suppose the worst part of it is employers and actually, um, I suppose, taking opportunity now of those who actually uh, are willing to take up some number of hours. Like, I think one of the things that has really struck me looking at the Irish data is the increase in numbers in involuntary um, uh, part-time employment and the increase in numbers in uh, full-time temporary employment over the past two decades. Overall, there has been stability in, 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 in other parts of what we might call precarious work, but there has been an increase. And I think certainly um, when you see the number of people who want to take up jobs but aren't being afforded the right to take up full-time work or work that is going to give them an, a, 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 a decent level of, of, of income. I think on the technology issue, Michael touched on this. Um, there is no doubt that the, the labour market as we have now is going to be dramatically transformed over the next 30 to 40 years. It's something to be embraced. We need to make our workers more resilient to be able to, um, I suppose, take up those jobs and not have the scenes that Michael talks about, whereby men in, young men in their 40s effectively never worked again. Um, we have seen that to a certain extent with construction in this country. Um, uh, men in their 50s coming out of the labour market, and I think that's another thing that hasn't been spoken about here, is the decline in the employment rate amongst males um, uh, since the crash. Some of it is because young males are now taking up education when they didn't before, but it's also males, older males coming out of the labour market altogether. So it is about that training and that skilling, uh, funding and, and, and ensuring that the appropriate resources are there to, to, to target those individuals. Right, okay. Um, Matt, thanks very much for coming. I know that you've been Apologies. in terrible rush, so we appreciate that you're able to make yeah. it at all. We'll give you a couple of minutes just to, to catch your breath before yeah. we ask you to go and give us a little uh, overall summary. But just before we do that, um, Michael, just to respond to one of the points that Marie made. In her opening speech, she mentioned that we're in the middle of drawing up a new seven-year EU budget, which will take effect from the start of the next decade. And she says that she would like to see the lion's share of that go towards practical things, like funds to retrain the men that you talked about who lost their jobs in the other factory and who never worked again. If we leave too much to Europe to do that, then are we not actually shooting ourselves in the foot? Should we not be taking more of responsibility here at home to do that kind of thing instead of outsourcing it to European training funds? But we are. And just a, an observation that people probably wouldn't know about the, the European budget. So I went over there last, I think it was October, when there was a big row between the Parliament uh, and, and the Council in relation to how the budget is, is allocated for the year. That was my first time there. I was completely unaware of what happens. So the, the European Union is a rules-based organisation. And you put into context the quantity, the budget for the year. The budget was 165 billion euros. That's what the budget was. To put that into context, the Irish national GDP, Ireland, Inc., small country, 5 million people, was 275 billion euros. So the European Union is a rules-based organization, it doesn't fund those areas. That's a mass, matter for each national competence of each government. So again, to put it into context, 160 billion for the European Union budget for the year. The Irish budget, capital and current, what the Irish government spends in Ireland is 60 billion. So that isn't the European Union space. The European Union space, where they've been most successful, is getting the rules adhered to, organized, that Dan was talking about, so you have a, a European uh, standardization, which has worked out and worked out very well. We are doing that, and we've done that very successfully. And we've done that successfully by when you look at going back to the crisis. Um, at, the, at the highest point of the crisis, the Irish <coughs> tax collection amount was 11 billion euros. In that same year, the social protection budget in Ireland was 20 billion euros. There wasn't another jurisdiction anywhere who was paying out in income redistribution twice as much as they were taking in in income tax. And that's appropriate. That was what was required. And that what was done to ensure that we maintained minimum levels for people, whether they had lost their jobs or the older people, and to fund everything else in between. 
And that's something, it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right. Every party, most parties in, in the, I, I can speak for the Irish jurisdiction, we all believe in that. There isn't one of us who doesn't believe that that wasn't correct. And it was correct and it was done. Put into context, in 2018, the income tax take, seven years later, will be 21.5 billion. This jurisdiction will almost have doubled the quantum of income tax take in seven years. When I'm out and about selling Ireland uh, around the world, and I say that to, to companies and senior executives or to other governmental representatives, they are amazed that a country could double its income tax take in that short period because it wouldn't have happened practically anywhere else. Thanks for that thought. Um, Matt, let's give you a chance to, to weigh in on this. We were talking basically about the whole function of whose job is it to guard against the worst excesses of globalisation? Is it national governments or is it the EU as a whole? Should the EU have to carry the can because the EU is in some ways responsible for a lot of globalisation and some of the negative effects that it's brought to Ireland? As, as someone who uh, is there on the front line of seeing how Ireland uh, works with other countries every day of the week, uh, what do you think of that? Well, um, can I start by thanking the IIEA for the invite, apologising for being late and saying how great it is to be finally asked to perform at the Spirit Store. I've um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, been waiting for the invitation for a long time, Mark. Um, there is a guitar in the back and you don't know oh, what you, you're getting well, yourself Well, into you it. don't know what that would mean. <laughs> um, but um, to, to answer your question and the fundamental, and I actually thought when I got the invite that this was actually a great opportunity because... For the past two years, in many respects, I've been um, articulating the positives of the European Union in response to Brexit largely. Um, as you know, we campaigned um, for a Remain vote in mm -hmm. the North and have been working, probably spending up to 50% of our time in the European Parliament actually arguing why all of Ireland actually needs to remain part of the European Union. That's not to say, though, that the EU is a perfect entity. In fact, in many respects, I believe it's fundamentally flawed and there are huge um, difficulties with it. And I think one of the reasons why <coughs> we have a lot of the challenges that we're facing politically across Europe has been the failure of um, the European Union to take cognizance of messages um, largely in response to globalisation that they've been receiving from peoples right uh, across right across Europe and on a regular basis, actually um, alarmingly regular basis, um, and I would argue that the European Union, as it's currently constituted, is responsible for the fact that we effectively have a least part fascist party leading the Italian government. We have the rise of the far right um, all, across, uh, all across Europe. So in terms of the, the responses as to whether or not it should be a national or an EU um, responsibility to address um, address the issues that arise. Clearly, there's a responsibility for both. But as someone who considers myself to be an activist, I firmly believe that the most effective way and the most important way of um, delivering change is at a national level, because that's the only place where it's ever been um, d done. The nation state was the mechanism by which a lot of the post-war progress that we've seen was delivered. It's where we saw um, and have seen real risk of, um, distribution of wealth, um, equality measures, the welfare state, all of those things were put in place by national governments and largely um, they've been undermined by, by the European Union as it's constituted. I think what sometimes people forget is that the European treaties, as they're called effectively, a European constitution, although we're not supposed to call it that since the French and the Dutch actually rejected the, the very concept of that. But embedded throughout that is actually a political model which makes it very difficult to um, to change to change things and um, the eurozone as we know um, creates quite a number of difficulties in, in it limits severely governments um, options in terms of dealing with um, economic crises as we saw over the past number of years in many ways it leads to an only option available to to governments being that of what's called internal um, um, devaluation, which effectively means trying to um, decrease and put um, pressure on, on, on wages. And then the, 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 the issue of globalisation, in some ways globalisation has been used by, um, by political ideologues <coughs> to push through measures that they couldn't actually get through national, national parliament. So how often have we heard um, voters being threatened 
with the prospect that the markets mightn't like what you decide to do, and therefore, uh, and therefore these you know, um, markets behind the scenes. And I think that's important for the context of this debate, and going back to the point that I mentioned earlier on in terms of the rise of the far right, because that sense of disempowerment that citizens have um, will find um, a political home somewhere. And if people don't believe that um, the basic economic powers are going to be available to, to governments to, um, to enact, um, they will look at somebody and people who are offering simple solutions. And if you can't target the markets and if you can't challenge um, the, um, the, those people who are, um, who, who are embarking on hoarding, you know, huge amounts of, of wealth um, at the expense of everybody else, well then let's blame the people who are on a boat um, trying to um, escape war and famine or whatever um, the case may be. So I think, I think we're at a really defining moment in global, um, global politics, but I think the only way that we in Ireland looking at it can um, affect change in the short term is by changing our own political direction and in turn hoping um, that we can then play a part with progressive movements across, the, the, across Europe, certainly, and within the EU, certainly, um, but also I think it needs to be much broader than that. Okay, interesting thoughts, Dan. Uh, Matt, thanks very much for that. Um, Dan O'Brien, let me come back in on that. It sounds as if, from what Matt has articulated, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, that Matt is effectively blaming the EU for a lot of those ills, the rise of the far right or governments <coughs> that might be a little bit more authoritarian. It sounds almost to a certain degree like he's setting up the EU as the fall guy, where it takes all of the blame and not necessarily any of the credit. Yeah, like I, I think there's there's a long tradition of politicians blaming the EU when things go wrong, and I, I you know, I, I certainly, you know, I, I think there's a problem with Irish democracy; it's not perfect. There's a problem with European democracy; it's not perfect. Um, but you know, I certainly don't think the European political structures are can explain why some countries have done very badly recently and some countries have done well. Like, you know, how is it that Ireland has recovered very strongly and Greece hasn't? Uh, is that where we're both in the same currency union? We're both in the same European Union. So, you know, you, uh, you, 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 know, you can't use a variable to explain a constant. I'm sure Michael will want to take credit for it anyway, though, won't he? <laughs> well, I mean, politicians do. I absolutely, <laughs> politicians and government want to take credit for everything and politicians and opposition want to blame them for everything. Okay, so look, that's the, that's the political cut and thrust. But the, 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 you know, the European Union, as I say, it's not a perfect entity and there are particular problems around the Euro. But again, it was like the, you know, the, the Brexiteers who arg argued uh, that leaving the EU would suddenly allow the freedom to, to export to, to other countries. You know, Germany exports five times more to China than Britain does. They're both in the same European Union. They both have the same rules and regulations. Now, why is it that the Germans can sell so much to the Chinese with the same set of regulations, the same rules, as uh, than, than Britain does? Again, it just doesn't, it's just not a lot, you know, you can't logically say that people who have this exactly the same rules, uh, that if suddenly, those rules are in some way impinging on British exporters more than they are on, on, uh, on German exporters. Well, let, me, let me bring Maria in that because Maria, I think you're, you're furrowing your brow as if you don't entirely buy what you're hearing. No, well, I, I, I suppose um, I was actually just reflecting on something Matt had said about the, the, the appropriate level of, 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 of action and I'm just thinking we wouldn't have had, um, I suppose, all our labour laws or the vast majority of our labour laws, laws and gender equality laws if we didn't have the European Union over the past 40 years. Because ideally, I would love that uh, parties of the left would be able to, 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 to progress that nationally, but we haven't been there. So actually, the European, you know, I suppose, working in concert with other like-minded <coughs> parties at the European level has, um, uh, we, we've been able to bring that about. Um, just on the the issue of, uh, I, I, I suppose, the rules explaining why one country does better relative to another. Um, well, at the end of the day, um, I suppose this is the thing about uh, the currency union that, that is the Eurozone. You know, the debate has re-emerged as to the appropriateness of whether we should have a single currency. Um, and I think those who argued against it back in, in, in the, the late 90s, uh, 
are, are finding a newfound uh, home for their views, saying, well, you know, it didn't work, and Greece is the, the, the and Italy now are the examples of that. Ireland is there, much there are two members out of 19, though. So you can't say that it doesn't work on the basis of what a minority of countries have experienced. No, but, but I suppose my point is, at the end of the day, we're not so well integrated as, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, the member states of the European Union that we're all going to perform similarly. Like Ireland is a very different economy compared with, let's say, Greece. And in some ways, there was a number of exogenous or external factors that very much benefited Ireland at a crucial time coming out of the, I suppose, the domestic crash, which was exacerbated by the international uh, credit downturn, that meant that we were able to recover quite strongly. Now, that's not to say that there weren't domestic factors here. Certainly, if you look at, let's say, Greece, um, very different type of economy and hasn't been able to pull itself out. So, you know, I, I agree in some ways the rules can't explain um, why one country does well relative to another. But I think the other thing is the rules have also exacerbated, uh, I suppose, um, why some countries have done an awful lot worse. And certainly if you look at, again, I'm thinking of the likes of Greece or indeed, uh, I suppose, other countries who have persistently um, breached the fiscal rules. Um, you know, there is now a big dilemma as to uh, you know, where, where, where the, the fiscal, I suppose, system or st the, the structure, the system of rules, the fiscal rules, and it, it, that they've been honoured more in the breach than in the, in, 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 in the acceptance or, or, or honourance. Um, and I think that's going to be a real issue for, for into the future, uh, particularly with regards to debt um, and the reduction of debt. So, but the rules are much more elastic um, and flexible when they are breached by some member states yeah, uh, other yeah. than, than, yeah. than others. Mm -hmm. If um, Germany didn't breach the fiscal rules in the past, probably wouldn't have the economy that it has um, today. And you need to you know, recognise if you were to sell or go to um, parts of England and um, outline the conditions that many German workers are <laughs> operating under, um, that wouldn't necessarily have been um, an argument um, to would have convinced them to vote Remain e either. I actually agree with Dan on the <coughs> on the point that the EU is often seen as a handy vehicle for Irish politics to blame when things go wrong um, um, and not necessarily. It uh, always, I, I didn't mean just Irish always politics. Always to yeah, no, but it's, yeah. a, it's a particularly. But, but it's also. Always the but it's man, always it's yeah. also a very and has been a very handy vehicle for Irish politicians to get things done that they would like to get done, but they wouldn't like to necessarily let the Irish people know that they're getting like done. And one of the, I'm dealing right across, it's one of the big um, bugbears I have in terms of the issue of an Irish minister getting up and saying, I have no choice in this matter because Europe's making me do it. Now, in fairness, in defence of the EU, if Europe is making you do it, it's because at some point or another an Irish government minister was sitting in the council behind closed doors and signed up to it. Um, and all, in all likelihood, Irish MEPs were sitting in the European Parliament and also um, s signed up, uh, up for it. And it's one of the big frustrations I have when we see things that, yes, the European Union files are very complicated and very convoluted of times, but we're dealing with legislative files that will have a big impact on people's lives. Um, and nobody in Ireland knows, uh, knows about it. The media aren't engaged. There isn't a single um, journalist whose job it is to cover the European Parliament. There's not a single Irish journalist whose job it is to actually mm. see what's going on and, in, and inform people. When you consider you know, the political correspondents tripping over themselves in the doll, and I always cite the example of a time I was down in a, in a small village in um, East Galway and the local post office was being closed and it was coming up to the European elections and you had all the sitting MEPs and then you had all the local TDs and you had all the local councillors and they were all getting up and saying this is a scandal that our little post office is being closed and quite rightly um, in terms of their um, position but none of them actually said that part of the reason why all these post offices are being closed including our own is a thing called the Postal Services Directive um, which was enacted um, at a European level which basically makes it illegal for governments to actually invest in post offices because they have to be seen as a commercial entity. Now, they, that was agreed, the Postal Services Directive, by I think three different government ministers of three different parties over the, um, the lifespan of the file. All Irish MEPs at the time, apart from Barbara de Broom, who was from Belfast, um, um, supported it. You know, there was some articles where people were, were point, pointing out but 
yet the, the people who, if, if, in, if for example there was a motion or a piece of legislation going before the doll, the outworking of it was going to be the closure of 150 or 200 local post offices. You could be sure people would be aware of it. You could be sure there'd be thousands of people outside. And yeah. TDs would make a decision one way or another. They might decide that this is in the best interest. Mm. But they would be doing it in the context that people were actually aware what well, they were the, doing. The whole, I and don't deny at all that there's a democratic deficit there. And that's a, that's a talk for another time. But just on something that you said there, and I know, Michael, there's a point there that you wanted to come back on as well. <coughs> there is a, a point there, though, that every power Brussels has is one that either the Irish people or national governments have given to it. And you can't always just use Brussels as the bogeyman because... It pursues the policies that member states set for it. Sure, but can, can, I, can I just say the biggest disservice to Europe and the European Union over the years and decades has been anything that's good, it's the national parliaments have provided it, and anything that's bad, it's the EU, it's Brussels. So Matt's kind of gone in that, into that space when he spoke about the Postal Service Directive. That's essentially state aid. And the state aid rules have turned out to be very good in relation to companies, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to companies who, who were once owned by the state and they have a huge advantage that the state can invest and that company doesn't have to have a commercial mandate. They can trade badly, have terrible work practices and anybody who's coming in to compete with them, that they have a, an unlevel playing field. So that's what happened with the Postal Services Directive. So that the, state, the government of Ireland, even though it owns on post, can't reinvest big chunks of money so that bad practices can t continue in the post office network. There's a difference between that's bad practices and then just like bad and geography, social and just part and, of Ireland's and, concern. And bad geography, ge but that's... But there's no recognition for, for, social, for the social... Um, the, so the social um, provides... Like, um, I, I would have hoped that we are gone past the point of government representatives actually... Um, um, arguing um, the merits of privatisation, which is essentially what you're doing. No, 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 that's not where you're going. But, but, but that's, that, that's no, the outworking no, no, of, of okay, the right. agenda. That. No, no, that's not fair. What I said was the Post Service Directive has prevented governments putting money into, this, into the post office companies that were owned by the state and continue to trade that maybe they were the way they used to in the past. Best example of that is if you go back to people remember the bus service, there used to be a conductor on the buses. And now there isn't. Technology moves. Uh, the, I mean, it's we've gone it's beyond. The, we've gone beyond the era of people just having trading the way we used to always trade. So the idea now that there would be a conductor on a bus collecting money is a long way far removed from the reality of where we are. Can I just make a point as well and touch upon what Matt was talking about? I'm not quite sure if I if I um, mistaking what you were saying. I do apologise, but. The criticism of the EU and the rules and everything else, I think, is wrong in relation to the national governments. So you spoke about areas that have fallen behind, more or less, what you were, you were talking about. And if you, you're talking about Northern England and, and people voting Brexit, but that's nothing to do with the EU. That's the UK government, one of the wealthiest nations in the world, choosing not to go back and retrain those areas, kind of touching upon what we were talking about at the very start. So if you go to the areas that are falling behind, whether it's the Rust Belt, whether it's Northern England or Southern Italy, I mean, that's the national government choosing not to reinvest in education, in reskilling, in the knowledge economy that it will be the future. And one of the things that we have done really, really well here is we've given people the opportunity to get back into employment and as Dan said, or I think it was he said about, we're almost at the stage now where we'll have more people back to work than on any occasion before. And one of the things that, that I've seen since I've got into the job that I do, and I'm doing this for 12 months, it doesn't matter which country, which jurisdiction, which sector, or which, nas which senior executives that I'm dealing with. The Irish workforce is a fleet workforce. They are capable of moving, they are capable of re-educating, and they might go into a company and started doing a job at X or do something else. That isn't available on the continent. It's not available everywhere. And that is testament to why we have made the success that we have. And one other aspect of it as well, just going back to 2011 when the Fine Gael government took over, uh, Fine Gael led government with Labour, they absolutely understood that the model that was being uh, pushed and accepted in some other jurisdictions
by other the, the church as such yeah. was wrong. And that model was you couldn't keep cutting your way out of this. We understood that the economy had, had to That's grow. That's exactly what you did. Had to grow. No, it didn't. That's exactly we, what no, you no, did. We absolutely it's a lot understood. of austerity before you started reinvesting yeah, the but we, we did, but we, we got rid of aspects like the, the um, landing charge. We decreased the bad rate in the hospitality sector. We did so many things that brought it to a base, and then we started to grow. No, but you, and we understood you fully implemented an austerity agenda, and the outworkings of it are evident. I was listening to the news on the way down. Two things that have been done, housing crisis, health crisis, both of which have been caused because of serious lack of investment over the past the, um, decade. Exactly, but, but you're wrong, Matt, because if you take 2018, we will spend... More, no, I'm talking, but I'm talking about the mistakes that were made in no, 2011 no, you, are coming home to no, roost now. You're saying that now. Today, this yeah. year, we, we spent, said it back then as well. We spent 15 way, billion euros on health. There's another seven. That's coming from the private, or from the public side of, mm. uh, of funding. There's another seven, 15 billion. There's seven billion in the private side. Mm. We spend more on health than any other jurisdiction. So it's not funding. Oh, it's abso no, so it's absolutely. Not funding. Yeah, you're, so you're, you're managing right. it very badly so, as well. No, so I'm um, saying this very clearly. That, <laughs> Sorry, that, Mr. Uh, Jeffing, in the front of the stretching, I don't know if he was looking for a question. He was desperate Matt, for someone to continue. Matt's answer, <laughs> Sinn Féin's answer is keep taxing more and keep spending more. We tried that. It got us into the hole we were in in the first yeah. place. And Sinn Féin have become the new Fianna Fáil. Right. Promise everything to everybody, okay. and nobody's going to I, I don't doubt that there'd be a very interesting route to have about the direction no, well, of the Well, can I just policy. talk about the earlier point in relation to Brexit? We, we, and, uh, maybe we can, we can get back to that just time yeah. for me, but I do want to make sure that we do a, a deal with okay. some of the, the broader points. Uh, let me go back to, to, to Dan and that, Chief Economist of the IEA. Um, you both, both yourself and Michael, talked about some countries which have done better than others, and some of them have tapped into the facilities. And Michael mentioned the fact of the northeast of England, uh, you know, which voted in large spades for Brexit, because in, in some ways its own government wasn't tapping into European retraining funds that were there to cater for the likes of Nissan no, workers. No, sorry, and it's European retraining funds. Those funds are available from its national conference, the national budgets. They just haven't gone in that direction. But then should it not be the role of the EU to ensure that they do? That in certain cases, does the, should there be a role for the EU to say, well, actually, we know what's good for citizens here and we're not going to let domestic politics hold them up? Well, I, I think we need to be careful that the amount the European Union spends with all its funds is just so time, tiny. Time. The amount government spends is usually about 30 to 40 times more than the EU spends. So, like, the states do three broad things. They provide security for citizens. They redistribute money and they regulate. The EU does the regulation piece. It's the environmental regulation. And, and like Matt, the reason no media has anyone in the European Parliament is nobody clicks on those stories. MEPs are uh, regulating for uh, sausages. Nobody cares. People just don't read that stuff. It's dull. Uh, it's and so how many people would care if the European Parliament was regulating sausages? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm disappointed in a few people that was. Well, right, well, subscription service here for all of those people. You can hand over the cash and I'll, we'll organise to get somebody over to, over to Brussels. But uh, now I've lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, the, the, so, you know, the European Union just... We don't give the European Union the amount of money that it would then reallocate back to poorer regions. That is a national decision. No, I lived in Italy uh, for a few years. The south, the south of Italy was getting money from the north for decades, going all the way back to the 50s. And it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily improve things. The gap between the north and south of Italy is, is still as big as it was uh, in the 50s and 60s. And yet the gap between east and west Germany, for example, is a lot less than it used to be. It's not, not an awful lot. Yes, it has narrowed a bit, but it's not, not as much as you would have thought, even though there has been a big redistribution. Like, you know, I think some areas go, just like some countries, go through periods of strong growth and are successful, and then they go through periods of not being so successful. It's not necessarily all down to government involvement. You know, the, the truth of economists have to be honest and say, you know, we don't fully understand economic growth. Mm -hmm. So we can't be sure why one area does particularly well for a period of time. There are a lot of factors going on there. But the, the, we, we don't even give, national governments don't give the resources to Brussels that Brussels would be able to decide, you're not giving enough to that particular region within your country. We just don't, governments haven't given Brussels that, those powers. Where should it give? Should national governments give Brussels those powers? Should, I mean, some people are, are very wary about making the EU a bigger creature than it is, but yeah. evidently, in some roles like this, the EU doesn't have the, the firepower to be able to do its job. And in some ways, that debate about fiscal transfers within the European Union has retreated because of, I suppose, this uh, backlash against uh, the EU project over the last number of years. But in some ways, if we are going to have the full workings of 
the monetary union, then we need to have, um, I, I think, something more than what is there now. And I'm wary of saying a fiscal union because I don't fully subscribe to that either. Um, but, uh, but certainly, um, and Dan touched on it earlier about an, uh, I suppose an unemployment fund, I can't remember the exact phrase you used, but, like as in, but I think there is a role for centralising uh, certain funds um, within, at an EU level and then allocating uh, to the areas most in need. So in some ways, you know, we've had that model with regards to structural and cohesion funds and there's no reason why that can't move into a different sphere. Um, but I think that requires a very serious debate about where, where we want the EU to go. And I suppose it's just struck by the discussion there a few minutes ago about, you know, EU is good, bad or whatever in terms of like as in the, the, the legislative agenda. And in some ways I think we've had a bit of a pick and mix uh, attitude towards the EU because I'm just struck, like as in I spoke earlier about um, you know, the gender equality legislation in terms of equal pay, uh, labour legislation, which to be fair, you know, Michael's party, you know, in government would never have introduced. Um, so in some ways, pardon? Well, sorry, but over the past <laughs> three to four decades, like as in, you know, we, we give it the opportunity, didn't introduce it. Um, but then on the other side of it is, you know, we have directives coming from, let's say, uh, from Europe at the moment with regards to public procurement. And the Irish government, the ex current government has taken a very narrow um, uh, interpretation of that public procurement and actually there is great potential within that th those public procurement recommendations to actually insert social clauses or what's called the, the meet the most economically advantageous tender so moving beyond the lowest uh, bid to actually something that is a bit better fleshed out and and, and, and and this government has not taken that opportunity to adopt that in its fullest sense uh, and, and introduce public procurement rules which would actually benefit Irish companies all the more, arguably anyway. Um, so yeah, Sorry, no, just, just as an interesting small poll, just the idea that Dan put out earlier on about having the idea of a kind of centralised European fund and then you would take unemployment benefits or whatever were necessary out of that, just as a, a straw poll, hands up how many people think that would be a good idea? And hands up how many of you think that that would be uh, national governments losing too much power, it would be the, make the EU too big? Very similar. It's interesting. Um, do we have a moving microphone? Because I want to start bringing in some questions from the floor. But before I do that, uh, Donald Story, who's the chief economist with Eurofound, has been uh, sitting at the front, uh, taking very assiduous notes the whole way through for the last hour. Uh, so he is now going to be giving each of our uh, panelists uh, basically a grade. <laughs> I think. Uh, so you'll be administering the pop quiz. The microphone there in front of you, Donald. What do you make of, of everything you've heard from the, the yeah. stage this evening? Yeah, I can try and uh, plug in some of the things. Just to say that uh, I work for the European Foundation on Improvement of Living and Work Conditions, which is the EU agency that are part of the European um, set up uh, doing uh, social economic research for the European institutions. Sorry to interrupt, Don. Can, can everyone hear Don look okay? No. 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 Uh, <coughs> can you just hold the microphone just so closer to your mouth, Don? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just uh, Thank you. Uh, a few comments about uh, globalisation. I think it is pretty clear in this broad perspective that Dan's talking about that you know, globalisation essentially does uh, create huge economic wealth. Uh, there is gain with it. Uh, there's also uh, no doubt at all that uh, there's also pain with it. Uh, it doesn't uh, benefit uh, everybody. And uh, you know, you talk about perceptions of uh, globalisation. I would say that. Uh, you know, people uh, tend to have, uh, people in the street, the man who <coughs> in the street, tend to have a rather negative uh, view of globalisation. On the other hand, I would argue that economists, I'm an economist myself, generally have had too positive um, uh, an impression of globalisation and that the pain of globalisation is much bigger than uh, we have previously thought. There's lots of very good research in the United States, uh, pre-Trump, uh, shall I say, uh, that has shown that the costs of globalisation for the American workforce have been quite uh, appreciable. Of course, for a country like Ireland, uh, uh, is, it's even more uh, globalised, uh, exposed to the market, to uh, global forces than perhaps any country in Europe. We are what you call a small, open economy. Uh, we're exposed to risks, we're exposed to the pain, we're exposed to the gain. And uh, when you're exposed to risks like this, what you really need is uh, an economy, a social system that can ensure against these risks. And uh, uh, typically, uh, some of the more, most open economies in the world, and have been for um, uh, 40, 50, 60 years, uh, have been the Scandinavian countries. And a part of the reason for the development of their extensive welfare state is an insurance mechanism against the extensive globalization that they embarked upon. 
Uh, also, as some have mentioned, the EU has a, a rather weak uh, mandate uh, at, uh, for a social policy. And also, uh, the mandate that they have, it's very, very difficult to get some of the member states on board. Perhaps it'll be a bit more easier to get them on board uh, when a large member will be leaving in a couple of years with a particular, uh, often, um, uh, political uh, orientation. Uh, most of the social policy in the European Union um, is related to the single market, uh, the type of things that Marie was talking about, the equal treatment and so on. Uh, when we have a market, uh, it's important that this uh, competitive market, these competitions need rules, and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, rules to create a, a level frame, uh, playing field are part of that. Uh, I, I would uh, wonder, Matt, if you were sort of um, mixing a little bit globalisation and Europeanisation. You know, it is the state, uh, I, I agree with you entirely that uh, uh, the developed post war uh, welfare states are one of the great achievements of uh, the world, I think. Uh, we have eradicated old age poverty in the national welfare state. But we have globalisation. Uh, ha if we have to accept that uh, we need to trade, uh, then we need multinational governance. And that's what the EU is trying to do, is to try and sort of you know, put manners on uh, the worst forms of global uh, competition. Uh, we have, uh, the same token, I would agree with Dan, that some things like training policy, active labour market policy, perhaps it doesn't really make sense that that's uh, done by Brussels. But certainly in this era of global uh, giants, uh, you know, an Irish industrial policy, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, Irish competition policy, we need this European uh, framework. Uh, the European Union cares about cohesion, uh, cohesion in terms of holding the Union together, and uh, there's some reference to the budget. Uh, a large, the main part of the European budget has been in trying to get the uh, poorer member states to catch up, and many of them have. Uh, this country knows that uh, better than uh, many. The catch up has been huge, and in that respect, this cohesion policy has been successful. What has not been successful uh, is that. Uh, in the last 20 years, there have been very, very strong tendencies towards inequality within member states. And, uh, uh, you know, largely speaking, uh, the member states have not wanted the European Union to stick its nose into that business. They, rightly or wrongly, they think that's part of their business. Uh, that, that's the, the business of the member states. But actually, uh, the stability, perhaps it's a little bit strange, I'm sort of halfway out in the Atlantic here in Ireland, the stability of my country is very dependent on the stability of my neighbours. And it's important that uh, uh, countries hold together, that countries uh, have this uh, cohesive uh, nature internally for other countries to feel stable. And actually Brexit is a, a perfect example of that. Uh, it, I would argue that uh, a large reason for Brexit, perhaps it's, it's not you know, the only one exclusive or whatever, but that the huge gains made by globalisation, uh, the market economy in Britain, were not shared among the people in a reasonably fair way. And that was a large part of the disenchantment that the British felt and voted uh, against the European Union, right or wrongly, wrongly, of course, I think. And that, and that impacted on Ireland. So actually, Ireland should care about the income distribution of Britain. The stability of our country, the, the economic prosperity of our country, depends on the prosperity and the stability of our neighbours. Um, um, thank you for all those points. Very interesting stuff. Um, this is probably not a yes or no question, but I'm going to ask you for a, a yes or no answer if it's possible. Or you can say ish if it's not a yes or no answer. Um, are a lot of the ills that you've identified where you know, individual member states are responsible for some of those problems? Or am I do, doing it too simply? Do you think it's the case that individual EU member states are actually carry more of the blame and more of the burden for some of those problems that you've mentioned there? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for keeping it to a yes or no, because I was worried where that was going to go. Right.